All right, if you're in the right spot on It's Learning, you'll see the quiz lecture metamorphic rocks. Uh, question one is a true-false question about protoliths. And we're going to dive right in here and get through this. Here we go. So what you're seeing here are some metamorphic rocks. Uh, this is actually a picture that uh, I took in Ireland. So this is right here in the background. There's actually some bits of marble laying around back here, some beautiful white marble, which is really cool. Uh, and just take a look at how folded and bent this rock is right here. It was just a really cool looking rock. You can see how rock can actually be deformed by the movement of Earth's plates. It's, it's kind of astounding that something like a rock could get bent and twisted like that. That originally was flat and horizontal uh, parallel to the Earth, right? Uh, over here is a little picture of a, um, some schist which has some garnets in it. You see those little pretty, pretty little uh, reddish colored things in there. You identified those in the mineralogy unit. So uh, that's one of the minerals that helps us know what kind of metamorphism took place if you find garnets. So uh, this is actually from a hike that my wife and I took. It was pretty cool. Uh, we went hiking through uh, what's called the 12 bends in 12 bends. I think it's the 12 bends. I don't remember. Uh, but I think Ben is essentially peak in, in uh, Ireland. I don't know. They call, the, they call their mountains that. Um, but we hiked up into this mountain range, and it was really cool, like this whole horseshoe. Um, and as we went up, we went up into the clouds. It was pretty neat. I'll show you a couple of photos here. So this is looking down from up there. We actually started down there by that river, and we hiked up to the top of this. And it's like a horseshoe, so you go all the way around, and we came out the other side over here on the far right. So uh, it was a heck of a day. Um, but it was a lot of fun. It was really cool. And as we walked, we literally walked through all these metamorphic rocks. I was so excited. It was really cool to look down uh, and actually see bits and pieces of marble. At first, I wasn't even sure what they were because I'm not used to seeing marble because I don't live in the mountains. Uh, but yeah, there are little bits and pieces of marble everywhere, like this beautiful white stone. Uh, it was pretty cool. You can see the clouds kind of coming in here. This is up near the top of one of those peaks, a little puddle of water up top here, a little cairn, uh, a little tarn, a little lake. Uh, so it, this fog comes in, and luckily, uh, I was prepared. I had uh, my, I not only had maps that I had created for myself, <laughs> but I actually had my compass, because it wasn't long before we hit this fog as we climbed into the mountains, and everything just went white like this. And we were just, we were literally just navigating with the compass. It was the only way to see anything. There was no visual landmarks. You couldn't see down. Uh, we were up on the top of this thing. We went from peak to peak. It was pretty cool. This is what it looked like just before we went through there. So it got kind of cold as we went up there. <laughs> and uh, you know, a little bit of mist and things like that. But it was a ton of fun. So metamorphic rocks are typically found in mountain ranges. It's pretty commonplace. So what do metamorphic rocks? What, what does that word mean? Well, meta comes from the word change. And morph means shape. So these are rocks that have changed shapes in a way. They all come from a parent rock that we could refer to as a protolith. So uh, lithic meaning rocks, proto meaning like first rock. So protoliths are the original rocks. So in the case of something like marble, which is this beautiful white stone, beautiful white rock, it actually comes from its protolith is this dirty looking piece of ugly gray limestone. So if you heat and cook limestone, you get this gorgeous white marble out of it. Um, but you can literally do this to any rock, so any rock could be a protolith, but specific metamorphic rocks come from specific protoliths. That makes sense. You see all the banding on this. Another characteristic of metamorphic rocks is all this banding that you see here, this alignment of different minerals in them, which is different than layering like in sedimentary rocks. Everybody got that first one? Cool. Looking at the whole thing of... Uh, all of the parts of the rock cycle here. Um, you can see we're over, where are we at here? My metamorphic rocks. Right here in this blue section in the middle here, uh, you can actually see, we're gonna look at some of these. Quartzite, nice, marble, schist, shale. Uh, the formation of a type of coal that we call hard coal. What, what type of rock, sedimentary igneous or metamorphic, is coal? Remember the bituminous coal we looked at the other day? It was part of the sedimentary rocks we looked at, right? It's decomposed plant remains. Well, it turns out if you squish it and cook it a little bit, 
you get a different form of coal. It's known as anthracitic coal. We'll talk about that. It's also called hard coal. Um, so we'll look at all these metamorphic rocks as we go here. And we'll go down to lab here in a bit and identify some of them. There are two main ways that metamorphic rocks formed. One is called regional metamorphosis, and that has to do with building mountains and plate tectonics. So as the plates of Earth collide together, uh, we create this folding and bending and heating of the rocks, and that gives us uh, regional type uh, formations. So this is the answer to question number two, if you're on there. Regional metamorphism, oops, sorry, went a little too fast there. Regional metamorphism is big scale, like it's whole areas. Um, you go down to say the, the Appalachian Mountains, like the whole mountain range is regional metamorphism, okay? Um, contact metamorphism, on the other hand, has to do with magma contacting the sides of its chamber. Contact metamorphism has to do with, with magma contacting the sides of a chamber. So it's not as much pressure as it is just the heat baking the rock. And we refer to them as baked contacts. Typically in regional metamorphism, you get a lot of foliated rocks. In contact metamorphism, you get non-foliated rocks. So we'll talk about those here in just a second. So jot down the two main types. There's another type of metamorphism that deals with hot water moving through rocks. But these are the two big ones. Regional metamorphosis versus contact metamorphosis. So um, when we talk about the character of metamorphic rocks, uh, we're, we're looking, for, there's some pretty unique textures that are involved in them and unique minerals that we find. So uh, when we look at some of them, they have interlocking crystals in much the same way that igneous rocks do. The crystals are kind of grown together. Uh, but we see some different things. We're gonna see some minerals that only exist in metamorphic rocks, so they're key to identifying them. We're also gonna see that some of the minerals in here uh, create this foliation, this alignment, where that you get bands, or like sheets of different types of mineral layering next to each other, okay? Um, so as this occurs, uh, it changes the rock type entirely, right? You can go from a shale, which is the protolith here, all the way to a gneiss, which is a metamorphic rock. So that rock there, that kind of ugly, reddish, orangish rock there, transformed into this beautiful looking rock with all these cool crystals in it. Okay. So uh, it's, remember, it's not a complete melting though. It's a, like kind of a, if at best, even sometimes just a partial melting if in the case of a migmatite. So there's several things that are in play to cause this metamorphism. The first is that minerals actually change their shape and size. So if you start off with the sandstone here, which has these tiny little clasps of sand, as they get heated, and squished, they kind of grow into larger grains and kind of interlock a bit and look a little different. We're gonna see that today because we're gonna see what comes from sandstone is something called quartzite. It, it looks much cleaner and purer looking. Uh, some minerals will actually change phases. So go from one mineral to a totally different mineral. For example, like andalusite will become this beautiful kyanite. So many of the pretty minerals that we see like at Gem and Rock shows are actually metamorphic minerals. Uh, new minerals with changes in temperature and pressure uh, are formed through this thing called neocrystallization. So new crystallization. Um, what can happen is the original minerals can become so unstable that they actually change into totally brand new minerals. So it's not that they just grow bigger, they change to something totally different. Um, and then there's chemical reactions that occur that cause some of the minerals to be digested and actually change into totally different ones. Um, so you can start out with one thing again, like this kind of ugly looking clay and quartz in this shale and transform it into a garnet 
Micah Schist. Um, now, when they're under pressure, dissolution can occur, okay, if there's some water present. So you can get totally different things if there's a little water present in the rocks. So uh, what can occur is that the minerals literally dissolve where their surfaces are, are pushing together. Um, and then bits of that material in, in ionic form migrate uh, in the water film and, f and form new films. So this is part in part kind of why you see this kind of flattening and banding in these things, in these metamorphic rocks. Here's another picture of the same thing, okay? As they get smushed together, they can get deformed. The rocks getting squeezed. Remember, they're not always getting squeezed just like this. Sometimes they're getting squeezed kind of off, offset and getting smeared as they get pushed together. It's a slow process, right? If it happened fast, the rocks would just break. They'd just fracture. Um, so what can cause metamorphism? Well, here are the biggies. Heat, pressure, uh, compression or shear forces, and hot water. Those are the big causes of metamorphism. That's the next question on your paper. Jot down the four maiden agents of metamorphism. So it's not that you just get one of those. They could all occur at once, or some of them could occur, or just one of them could occur. It just depends on what you've got happening with the rocks. In this picture here, we've got lots of different metamorphism happening. Uh, where the oceanic plate is dipping below the continental plate, there's a bunch of sediment that's being compressed and pushed together right here. It's probably going to form something called a greenstone, a little metamorphosed rock where, it, where it's been pushed and kind of the heat and the pressure is causing it. Uh, over here underneath the ground, underneath the volcano, you've got some contact metamorphism. That magma chamber is touching the rock surrounding it. It's heating it, and so it's getting cooked, right? So that's mainly heat. Yeah, John? Oh, yeah, loads of them, absolutely. Um, in fact, like all of Yellowstone is essentially a big magma chamber. I know there's a big volcano, a super volcano sitting on top of the whole thing, but it's, it's not erupting or anything like that. And right now, while it's underneath there, it's making metamorphic contact on all the rock it's touching. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, even you, you get a lot of those things kind of side by side. You might have a volcano happening in one location, and right next to it, there's a chamber of magma that never erupted. Right? And then so it, it, it made all kinds of contact metamorphism. And then later, the ground has to get lifted up in the air, and it all has to get worn away for us to ever see any of it. But that's happened, so we have lots of metamorphic rocks on our surface. Um, most of the basement rock of our planet, of course, is metamorphic and igneous. So if you go down far enough, that's what you hit. Okay, did everybody get that one? The four agents of metamorphism. All right, so the words that I keep using here, foliation, is it develops perpendicular to the compression. I'm going to show you another picture of that here in a second with some slate, how it forms. But as the minerals flatten and, and recrystallize, they'll rotate direction to be in line with the, with, the, with the direction of pressure. And it makes sense if you're pushing on something like this, let's say it's a book, it's going to turn and flatten out that direction. But it looks weird because it's the opposite direction to how the rocks got laid down to begin with. Let's see if we have a picture here. There we go. So here's an old guy making some uh, slate uh, shingles. Have you guys ever seen a slate shingled house? It's not very common. If you go to IU, there's a lot of buildings on campus that actually do have slate shingles. You look up top uh, at some of the older buildings, that's rock up there. Like, think about the structure you've got to have underneath of that to support all that rock. It's really heavy stuff, but it looks really cool. And it essentially, like, never wears down, right? It's, it's rock, it's a rock roof. It's pretty cool. So this guy's splitting these, these shingles out of the slate. So slate starts out as maybe a shale, and its bedding plane is horizontal with the Earth's surface because of gravity, right? So it originally starts out like this in the bedding plane here in the middle. Then after pressure occurs, well, pressure's occurring from the sides and pushing together like this, the new plane happens vertically to that. So it actually, it, its new metamorphic plane is perpendicular to the flat bedding plane of that original material. So when you see these structures out in the wild, it, it kind of looks like the rock has maybe been tilted when maybe it hasn't. 
It's just been compressed on its sides and then recrystallized in these kind of vertical patterns. Okay. Everybody able to answer that question there? Everybody good with that one? Cool. So when we talk about uh, foliation, foliation just means that things that the rocks have layers like in sheets. Just think of like foliage, like the fall leaves or whatever. They're they're flat, okay? Kind of looks like a stack of papers. So what they're what causes this is large amounts of mica minerals. And, and that's actually what's making all these little sparklies. Do you remember biotite and muscovite? The reason we learned those two minerals is not just because they're cool and flat and bendable and flexible, but because metamorphic rocks like contain can contain a lot of those, and that what that's what gives them in part some of this like layered and banded appearance. And look close here at schist and phyllite. You'll notice another property that we refer to as schistosity. And that just means that it's kind of like shiny and shimmery. And that's because of those micas. Yeah, John. That's a great, great question. I don't know. I think a number of them are actually German names um, in other, in, were formed in other countries. Um, many of the words we have come from England or German or other places where some of the original um, petrology was actually done because this is an old science. It's a really old science. Uh, so a lot of the words we have came from other languages. And I mean, like, where does nice come from? It's definitely not an American word. <laughs> it's not an English word either. Uh, I don't know where that comes from. I, I would guess Germany. Somebody could probably look that up. I'm sure, I'm sure we probably know that. There's some words that are so old, like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, like feldspar. Nobody, that's an old English word, and nobody really knows what it means. Except that spar usually means rock, and they think feld is the old English word for field. So it might have meant like a rock of the field. But, but <laughs> right now it has a very specific meaning, like it's that specific mineral. It's not even a rock. So a lot of this stuff is pretty old. So here's a, a sequence of metamorphic rocks. Uh, if we start with something like a shale, we could compress it and heat it to form a slate. As it continues heating and compressing, it would eventually transition into a schist. Okay? If you continued in heating it more with more pressure, eventually you'd have a gneiss. So you can see the transition here from lower grade metamorphism to higher grade. So if it stops anywhere along this process, that's what you've got. Okay? I think that might have been the next question it was. Everybody got that? So going left to right here, higher grade on the right, lower grade on the left. And we'll actually talk about another in-between one called phyllite, which you saw in the last picture. We'll see that down in lab. We've got some really weird names, right? <laughs> okay, so let's discuss, um, oh, we're not done with uh, foliation yet. So here's phyllite, I just mentioned it. It, it also fall, falls in between there. It's a low to medium grade metamorphic rock. Um, and it kind of looks shimmery. It's got some schistosity to it. It's right between slate and schist. So it goes from slate to phyllite to schist. And we'll look at that sequence down lab. Okay. Um, but you start to get those tiny micas, and it gets that funny little reflectiveness. Some of you guys, when you were bringing me rocks in the creek, that's what I was looking for. I was like, is it reflecting like a little, little micas in it? And then I'm almost certain I've got a metamorphic rock. Um, so as we move on up to schist, uh, it's a little bit coarser, you get some larger micas in there. It, it starts to potentially, doesn't have to, but it can start to have these garnets in there. So those are all start to be new minerals that we see for the first time. So here's a list of some of these over here. The only main ones we'll look for are the garnets. That would be a dead giveaway you have a schist if you see some garnets, garnets in there. If we keep going forward in metamorphism and keep squishing and cooking it, we will transform all of those minerals into a nice a very nice rock. And you can start to see that it's nice when you start to see these banding sort of structures. Everything starts to look banded. And these could be all kinds of different colors, just depending on what's in the rock. Okay. The darker things are the mafic minerals, and the lighter things are the felsic ones. 
and you can sort of visualize how that occurs. Like you can see here this, in this picture, how it's like being smushed and welded and bent as it goes, okay? Being kind of sheared as it's pushed. But those minerals also migrate. So on top of that, as it's being heated and cooked and pushed together, some minerals will actually migrate together in bands, and that's actually how those dark and light bands form in that. So these little lighter colors migrated together, and then the darker ones migrated together, and you get this weird banding structure. So you guys understand that banding is different than layering. Right? Layering in sedimentary rocks is because it got stuff fell down, another layer, another layer, another layer. This is banding for a totally different reason. It got heated, it got cooked, and the minerals migrated, they got smushed, they got pushed. So it, it does look different if you look closely. This is a migmatite. I'm gonna pull a big piece of this out down in the lab. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. This is what happens when you keep squishing and heating. Eventually you start to melt some stuff. <laughs> so if it gets, really gets partially melted, you start to kind of make an igneous rock. If you melt it all the way, you've got an igneous rock. But if you kind of just start to melt it, you start to get some really thick big bands in here of different minerals. And we call it migmatite. It's like partially melted nice. Okay, so you just, you can kind of see the sequence here. You keep going all the way until basically you have magma again, right? Yeah. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, it's based off of its texture, that it has the banded texture and I guess you could say it's also how it's made because that's how it gets that. With different things in it? Yeah, it could have slightly different minerals in it, for sure. It could have, you might even see different colors in there a little bit. Um, most of it tends to look kind of, well, you'll see some down in lab that you'll see some of the feldspars in it, some of the pinks in there, and you'll see other ones that have the whiter feldspars in there. Um, so part of it depends on just how cooked it gets and how smushed. And some of it is like, what did you start with to get there? Because you can take almost any rock, and if you keep heating it and cooking it and, and pressuring it like that, you'll make a nice. It'll just have a slightly different composition and look. So you really have to look at it and go, does it have those funny layering bands in there? I've got a nice. It doesn't matter what they're made up of. Or is it kind of at the schist stage of, is it got all those big micas that are reflecting? Because you can make those micas out of any, basically any melted rock depending on how it crystallizes, you could get those things out of there. So they'll still form. That's a good question. That's hard to answer. <laughs> okay, let's do the non-foliated ones. These are kind of like the chemical sedimentary ones and that you just have to learn them because they don't have any banding. There's no foliation. The dead giveaway to a metamorphic rock is it's got foliation or it's banded. It's got some schistosity to it. These things just look different. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a couple of them here, quartzite, is just cooked sandstone. There's little, if you look close, there's little bits of sand in there that are melted together. It looks like somebody purified the piece of sandstone. Marble is cooked limestone. And it's just like a purified, one of those gray limestone things. So it's loaded with really purified calcite. Is it gonna fizz? Yeah, it's gonna fizz way better than lime. I mean, it will really fizz. All the impurities have been cooked out of it. This can also be pink, it can be, like some slightly different colors, but you'll see these big crystals in it okay, when we get down to lab. So non-foliated rocks are the ones that you can't see the layering in. Everybody pick out the non-foliated rock there in that question. Cool. I'm gonna got a couple more here that I wanna show you. This is a special one, and some of you might find these down at the creek. I found one this year. Uh, <laughs> that's just a non-technical name. If you're from Michigan, you refer to these as pudding stones because uh, it looks like some figgy pudding or something, I don't know. But what's interesting is this is a meta-conglomerate. You know what a conglomerate is at this point. If it gets cooked a bit, that conglomerate will start to weld together. The, the bits of sand in there will start to melt a little bit and stick together, um, and they'll kind of weld around these other, other minerals. These are specific, these Michigan pudding stones, because they have a very particular form of this red jade in there or sorry, jasper, I mean, uh, that's super distinguishable, okay, so that you notice them. They come from a very specific spot, so much so that we can identify it today. So St. Joseph Island in Ontario, 
So they don't come from Michigan, but the glaciers picked them up and dumped loads of them in Michigan. They formed in this tiny little spot up here where that pin is on Google Earth. And they got drug all the way down here and dropped in Indiana. So we can tell precisely the spot where this particular meta conglomerate formed. Now you could get a meta conglomerate from anywhere, right? Any stuff could get welded together. But the, the composition this is made up of, there's an outcrop right there where it all came from. So when you find one of these, it's kind of special in that you know like it came from that little location right there and got dropped all the way down here in Clifty Creek. Um, and we even know how it, how it basically how it formed. Um, so uh, it's fill from erosional channels uh, from the Huronian glaciation about 2.4 to 2.1 billion years ago. It's a long time ago. That's the longest and the oldest ice age that we've had. And it's, it is a glacial erratic. Um, it's in Pleistocene glacial tills. So this is material that's been deposited down here from the glaciers. I've also found a few Pleistocene horse molars, so from the same time that have been dropped off down here. Uh, so it's, it's pretty neat to find one of these, and, and you might. So keep your eyes out for these. I've never seen one this big here. I found a few in Michigan that were big enough to use as door stops, like big like cantaloupe-sized ones. The ones I found down here are all pretty small, because you've got to imagine the glaciers really ground that stuff up, bringing it this far down. These, by the way, are really cool when you tumble them in the rock tumbler. They look pretty neat. Here's the extent of glaciation. So you can see Michigan, right, all the way up there in Canada where it came from. It really kind of just got to us. It, like, we're the edge of the last, like, a big advance here. Uh, so other non-foliated rocks here, we mentioned marble already. We mentioned calcite, quartzite, right? Comes from a sandstone parent versus a limestone parent. There's another one I want to mention because it's kind of special. It's anthracitic coal. So coal goes through a sequence too. In order to form coal, you have to have plants that died and fell into a swamp and got buried in an anoxic environment. And then over time, they form into a material known as peat. You might have heard of a peat bog before. So it's kind of this like, uh, I don't know, really organic sort of stuff you can dig up. Uh, in Ireland, there's a lot of this. And people burn it, they have peat fires. In their, uh, has anybody been to Ireland, the band trip? No, have you? Did you, did you smell any peat fires? Sod fire, they, they call them sod fires inside the, at first they're like really, you're like, oh, this is really cool. It's like a, a weird new smell you've never smelled before. But after a while, you're like, I can't breathe any more of this burnt, half burnt coal. It's just terrible, it's like it's filling up your lungs, right? Um, I don't know if you're around that much of it, but. Uh-huh. So you could definitely smell it, yeah. Yeah, pretty much the only place to eat anywhere in Ireland if you're outside of the big cities is in the pubs. It's the only place to go get food at all. And so when you're in the pub, a lot of the pubs like to light a fire of this stuff because it like attracts tourists and it's kind of quaint sort of thing. But it's, it smells really, after a while it gets pretty bad. So it starts out as this stuff called peat, uh, which this, the, in Ireland, they just go dig up dirt. Like, like that's what it looked like. They just peat farms. They just dig up these areas and bring them inside, dry them out, and burn them. After it sits long enough with enough pressure on it, it forms into this stuff called lignite, which is still some really terrible coal. It's not real good to burn. You could burn it, but it's not real clean. As it sits longer and gets buried more, uh, it could eventually become bituminous coal which we learned is a sedimentary rock. So it's now actually, oh, lignite's not quite a rock. Bituminous coal is definitely a rock. It's solid now at this point, okay? And that's what we call soft coal. If it gets heated a bit and really compressed a lot, it will become anthracitic coal, which is hard coal, which is the best, cleanest coal to burn. Not that we should probably be burning any coal because it's not real good for the environment. We dig up bituminous coal here in Indiana. It's dirty coal, it's full of sulfur and all sorts of impurities. So when you burn it, not only do you dump CO2 into the atmosphere, you create a bunch of acid rain and other really nasty stuff. Anthracitic coal, on the other hand, is a lot cleaner burning and it gives you lots more energy. Yeah, John. We do, we do. Uh, and in fact, modern day coal plants are much cleaner. They've got big scrubbers on top. And so they do try to collect like an awful lot of that stuff when it comes out. Um, it still doesn't really solve the problem of releasing all the CO2, um, but yeah, we really, 
we re we learned we had to do that because we were polluting the heck out of everything. Like it was just noxious. Um, but yeah, we still we still have a problem with it, but it is way cleaner than it used to be for sure. And there's still a lot of coal plants in Indiana. That's how we make energy. Like IU still has a coal plant. It's how they power campus. Somebody up probably down near Madison, there's a bunch. I think I've flown over them before. You can see the smoke. It looks almost like nuke plants, but it's just smoke from the coal factories going up. Yeah. So I'm going to put this up here. This is my buddy. My buddy Jocko, a while back, sent me an email. This has been a number of years. He traveled to Centralia, Pennsylvania, and this is a famous, famous location. Um, it's, it's mostly abandoned, he said, due to the fact that the ground, which is anthracitic coal, uh, is on fire. So underground in Centralia, Pennsylvania is on fire. He said the government forced most of it, the 1,100 residents to relocate. It's been on fire since the 60s, right, early 60s, but there are still about 30 residents. He said he saw some of the houses that still looked occupied. Overall, I said it was pretty boring and my lungs hurt, but I'm glad I went because I've heard a lot about it. It reminded me of the steaming bluffs in Hawaii. I've attached a couple of pics. One's of the closed section of Highway 61 and smoke coming out of the hills. So it's my good buddy, sent me these pictures. Like, doesn't it look like there's maybe gonna be lava that pours out? So I don't remember exactly how this fire started, if they were burning something, but they mined coal here. They mined really high quality coal here. It's a famous location in Pennsylvania. And something occurred, uh, there was some accident, and you can look it up online because it's, it's famous, and it caught the coal on fire. Yep. I th you might be right. It, that sounds familiar. I think you're right. It was they like burning some trash and it, got, it, it touched off the coal. Coal can be difficult to light, but once it starts burning, it is really hard to put out. So this stuff is smoldering underground. So much so that like it burns up whole areas and then houses collapse into it and catch on fire, right? Uh, there's places where the ground is hot. Obviously, if you put your hand there where the smoke is coming out, it's, it's hot there, right? So it also caught a whole bunch of the for surrounding forest and lands on fire as well. And breathing that stuff is just horrible. So the government, forced everybody to evacuate. Now, of course, there were some residents that were like, you know, government's not taking my land, you know, refuse to go. <laughs> and the government's just going, hey, look, it, they, you're going to die if you breathe this stuff. It's bad for you. And they're like, you're not taking my land. I'm going to stay here. Meanwhile, like all the grocery stores, all the schools, everything's gone. There's just like a few houses like back there where people just refuse to leave, leave their property. And they're just back there sitting in this smoldering horror. Um, but it's like really crazy, like look at this alongside the road driving through, like it's just still on fire underneath the ground. There's no way to put it out. Talk about environmental catastrophe. You see where all the trees have been burned away. They tried to bulldoze areas and try and contain it, um, but nothing they did worked. Um, and as far as I know, it's still on fire. The picture of the road there, this is my favorite one though. I'm, I'm sure knowing my, my buddy Jocko, he probably threw all those sticks in that crack. That's the highway. It just cracked open and it's burning underneath there. He was probably trying to start a fire, see if he could do it. But yeah, look at that. It's like there's smoke coming right out of that. I know, right? Like just driving in and being like, oh, whoa, like total like apocalypse. Like you're, I'm like, I'm looking at that expecting zombies to come out of the woods. Like who wouldn't? I don't think it is. I don't know. Like, <laughs> I mean, I have no idea how we got back there, but it, obviously there's people still living back there, so they get in and out somehow. Isn't that strange, though? <laughs> All right, I'll leave you with this one. Here's, uh, I'm visiting my dad down in, um, um, down in North Carolina. In North Carolina is, of course, in the mountains. And uh, he took me out on a boat ride, and I found this really cool rock. So the rock I'm standing on there, that's... Um, that's actually quartzite. And he kept calling this granite. I'm like, Dad, that's not granite. That's not granite. And we got up there closer and took a look at it. And sure enough, it was a whole bunch of schist. It was like layer after layer of schist. It had been metamorphosed. I'm like, it's really cool. I was finding garnets in it and things like that. It was really, really neat. So whoop, there you go. Okay, everybody.